So I put up this picture of uh, old George H.W. Bush and two of his sons. I don't know if he has more, but here is uh, in the middle center is uh, George W. Bush, former president, and then Jeb Bush on the left. And so this is going to be a podcast episode for uh, the Great Johannes podcast at uh, on YouTube at the Great Johannes. You can uh, follow me there as well. Uh, and here I wanted to use this photo to introduce a certain topic. Namely, you clearly see here that older Bush and younger Bush, George, are dressed similarly. Whereas uh, Jeb Bush is a bit different. He In the picture, he's a little bit awkward. Now, the picture itself proves nothing. But here you see what I want to talk about is how fathers can psychologically transfer themselves to their sons and how mothers can do the same with fathers and with their children. Uh, very obviously, George Bush, George W. Bush, took after his father, George H.W. Bush, and basically became another version of his father. All right. And this is quite an important uh, phenomenon. Uh, in the way we live, the way people live in this world, uh, imagine, you know, you're um, you are born, you're a small child, you're a baby boy. How do you even know what you're supposed to do? So you inherit your physical appearance from your parents' genes. But what I want to talk about is the other things you can inherit from them, which is their attitude, their demeanor, their psychology, their outlook in life, their uh, their career choices, for example. Here, George W. Bush becomes a president just like his father. Uh, lots of men become what their fathers were. But not all men. And that has to do with... Um, what I would call soul transfer. This is a bit of a strange word, psychological transfer or soul transfer. I'm just making this up because uh, I want to try to describe this phenomenon, how uh, a father can pass on not just his genes, but also his psychology, his mentality, his mind to, uh, uh, to his children. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, I'm doing a sort of a podcast episode where I wanted to talk about uh, the sort of the meaning of this picture. Uh, I can remove it now because I oh, let's see how this goes. Scenes. All right. So. Uh, I was thinking of or have been thinking for quite several months now about this topic, like um, why is it that some sons become just like their fathers other sons become something completely differently and why is it that some uh women become like their mothers and other women don't become like their mothers and you see here um uh, it has something to do also with the role you play in the household uh clearly if you are the favorite child or the favored child the parents are going to try to pass transfer the the positive or the strong characters of their own psychology onto their favorite child. They want their favorite child to be like them, basically. But you can also have a scapegoated child. Um, a scapegoat child literally receives the negative qualities of its parents. That is because the parents will project their own flaws and their own problems or what they perceive as problematic in themselves onto a scapegoated, scapegoated child. And that child becomes... Uh, the receptacle basically receiving all that negativity. And so uh, it may be interesting to look at your own um, family lineage to see how what was passed on through the generations, for example, right? Uh, I'm going to give you some made up examples here. So imagine that uh, uh, you have a grandfather who is an architect and your father is also a gra an architect. And basically, uh, your father would follow in the footsteps of, uh, of your grandfather, for example. Uh, and so that's what happens with some famous boxers. Their fathers were boxers and they become boxers. Or with actors, say someone's mother is an actor and the daughter also becomes an actor. I recently saw a video of a, of a young woman who won uh, the 10 kilometer run 
I think it was in the Commonwealth Games. And her mother had also won that twice in the 1980s. And so you see some people really take after their parents and other people don't, right? Uh, someone asked if I take after my mother or my father. Well, that's the question. I, I think I take after neither of them uh, because I was the scapegoat. So I receive all the bad things of them and I struggled getting rid of that. And that's something I also want to talk about. Uh, I'm going to put this podcast episode also on my YouTube channel so you'll be able to review it there. Um, so my father was an alcoholic and when I was around 30 years old, I would also uh, go out often with my friends and get really drunk. I would come home staggering, blacking out. But for me, this was not a feasible life choice. My body simply can't handle that very well. And so very early on, by the time I was 30, I quit drinking. Maybe nowadays I'll have a, a glass of wine once every two weeks, once a month or so. But I don't get drunk anymore. I, ha I simply had to quit doing that because it doesn't work for me. But you see that the behavior of your a negative behavior of your parents can, can, can be transferred to you, psychologically speaking. And then you will carry it out as well, unless you become aware of this and you basically sort yourself out. And so... Uh, you also have families where there's a lot of children who become priests or nuns. For example, in my family, if I go back far enough, there was a guy who was a bishop. There was someone who uh, became a priest. Another woman became a nun. For whatever reasons they have. Uh, maybe these people feel not so much uh, the recipients of something positive. I don't know how that works exactly. And I find this concept of transfer of psychological transfer so very interesting because there is it opens up if you are aware of it it opens up another uh possibility yeah it's a nature or nurture debate so i think physically you inherit the genes of your parents so you look like them obviously and athletic qualities maybe are like that as well and maybe cognitive abilities are like that as well but the other thing is like where you choose what you want to be in life, your profession or your attitude or your parts of your personality or your flaws or your talents. A lot of these things may have been psychologically transferred to you after you were born. All right. And this opens up the possibility that you can, if you are very religious, I mean, what is a God really? In most religions in the Western world, gods are or the chief God is a male deity, right? And so you see that the male God transfers his male qualities onto the people, onto his followers, the male followers, right? Uh, and so I was watching a video where a young woman from London moved to Canada to prove herself. And she starts going hiking and she starts going mountain biking and she starts going boxing or whatever. And uh, uh, what else did she do? Skiing and so on only to confess that she doesn't like to do any of these things. And then she returned back home to London where she was from. Here you see an example of a young woman who was pushed into her masculine energy. All right. I hope you can understand uh, if you're if you're a very feminine young woman, but you are you feel that you have to prove yourself that you can go hiking and skiing and mountain biking. Those are those outdoors activities are quite masculine activities. They're basically you're hunting, right? They're uh, substitutes for the hunt uh, and so some people are forced into masculine energy some people are forced into feminine energy and they realize that they don't belong there it doesn't feel right so they return to where they're supposed to be and you see also that in our modern society precisely because in the western world um, we have become less and less religious right so god the belief in god has almost gone away in western europe and lo and behold, what happens is uh, men stop being manly. Men stop being masculine in this sense. There's a real problem with uh, men in the Western world is that they no longer have this strong psychological transfer from a male masculine deity to them so that they know that they can be like that. And that's probably the root cause of, of, of a lot of problems you see in the Western world. The transgenderism, for example, what is that really? What is what does transgenderism really do? It pushes people from ever earlier ages into the wrong energy. Say you're a boy, but you're 
pushed into feminine energy, right? Or you're a girl and you're pushed into masculine energy. And you, you know those girls who start playing soccer or something, right? Uh, and to prove themselves, right? Be to prove that they can do what a man can do. But why would you do that? If you are a woman, why would you care to prove what a man can, that you can do what a man can do? You wouldn't have to care if you were feminine, right? Feminine women don't need to prove that they can do what a man can do. Right? And, and manly men or masculine men don't need to prove that they can be more feminine. Why would you want to prove this? Um, you're, you're being pushed into the wrong energies. Uh, I think that is really, a, uh, again, that lies at the heart of, uh, of everything that goes wrong in the Western world today, is this psychological transfer of a male deity to the male followers has been uh, cut loose, has been broken, in order to make room for the matriarchy, a matriarchal system. Uh, yeah, you can inherit many different genes from your ancestors, but also psychology. That's what um, the Swiss psychologist uh, Carl Jung wrote about this a lot. I don't know if you know who that is. Uh, Carl Jung, I'll write it down here uh, so people can see it on screen as well, I think. Yeah. So Carl Jung. Um, he wrote about this fact that imagine you are at some point in your life confronted with something unexpected and for your survival it is absolutely necessary that you succeed at something. Say you're being chased by a, by a mountain lion or something and the only way to save yourself is to climb up a rocky uh, face of a, of a mountain. Uh, you have to do some rock climbing to get away from the bear right? or, or the lion. And all of a sudden you find that you're able to do it even though you've never done this before. You climb up the rock wall and you succeed in escaping. Where does that come from? How did you know that you could be a rock climber if you've never done this before? Well, that is because you carry within yourself, within your mind, your soul, your being, you carry the experiences of all your ancestors. That's what Carl Jung claimed, at least. He believed that um, you have ancestors who were warriors, you have ancestors who were rich, you have ancestors who were very intelligent. You are able to tap into those experiences um, and use them when you need them without really having been trained to do so right yeah it's, it's better to embrace your own gender in the sense i i think your birth sex is your gender and there's no real there shouldn't be any doubt about it but of course our society deliberately cut loose the um, this connection between boys and fathers and between also between girls and their mothers uh, this disconnection from which happens, of course, when children have to uh, are sent to school nowadays, right? So when did we start doing this? When did we start removing children from their parents and move them into the school system? I read about this a little bit. And in, in Europe, it started around the 16th century, where the Protestant, the reformists, they wanted to um, instill their teachings into the children and they started classical or classroom education. They started in the churches first, those became the first schools. And then later in the United States around the early 1800s, someone actually invented classroom education to instill the values of the state onto these children. So we start removing children from their parents at ever earlier ages. Now you have women uh, who have three, ba three month old babies and they dump them in daycare, six month old babies and so on. These children will, will always be disconnected from their parents. They will be, what do you call it? Uh, they will have an avoidant, an avoidant psychology or something. Or an, uh, uh, they, they do not have a secure attachment to their own parents. And boom, that's exactly why I think in our time, we see all the transgenderism popping up everywhere. Because the, uh, if a child does not feel connected or attached to this or that parent, uh, then how are they ever supposed to receive that psychological transfer of of the qualities of their parents, for example? Say, uh, say you have a father who is incredibly confident, but you have no secure attachment to this father, then you're not going to inherit that confidence. And that's my point. There, you, sh you need to see the connection to your parents, more, some, something like a, like a pipeline. But if the pipeline is cut, then you won't receive... Uh, uh, you won't receive th their powers. So it's also a transfer of power. Uh, say you have uh, a very extroverted parent. If they 
if you have a secure connection, secure, a secure attachment to that parent, you may inherit that kind of extroversion as well and be like that as well. Um, in our time, you see that increasingly the state removes children from their mothers or keeps mothers away from their children and so on and so forth. And you have then this crisis where the children no longer feel attached to their own parents, but feel also not attached to anything else. They are not attached to any kind of God or even a goddess. They are attached basically to a very cold, sterile state system, right? So that's, uh, that's just what I wanted to talk about a little bit. Let me see. Uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to pop out the comment section here. <laughs> All right. It's in the afternoon on a Saturday, so I guess there's not that many viewers this time, but that's okay. I'm going to put this video on my YouTube anyway, so we can uh, uh, t talk about that a little more. Um, so I showed you this photograph here earlier. Well, put it over here a little bit. So this is George H.W. Bush, the old one. With, in the center, you have George W. Bush, who also became president, and then Jeb Bush, who never became president. And this picture is very symbolic because it kind of shows you that Jeb Bush is the odd duck out. He's not in line in the image, right? He doesn't wear the same kind of colors or suit. Uh, he, he has his hands out, whereas uh, Bush Sr. and uh, George Jr., they have their hands in the same way, right? Uh, it means that the younger George, I meaning George and his father George are clearly are clearly well connected securely attached in the sense that um, they mimic each other and in order for you to feel that you are allowed to mimic a parent means you need that parent's support or approval when that is gone when you don't have the support or the approval of your parent uh, and you feel rejected then you're not going to follow in their footsteps and maybe Literally in this image, you see that Jeb Bush's feet are also pointing away. He's not in his father's footsteps. He's not walking in the same direction. And I thought that was very... So the image is just symbolic. It, in itself, it doesn't prove anything. But the symbolism is there that Jeb Bush is not following his, in his father's footstep. And indeed, Jeb Bush never became president. He, uh, I think he did... Uh, he lost to Donald Trump. Remember, in 2016, he, he participated as a candidate. But he never uh, got very far. He was uh, basically thrown out the race. Um, hey, how are you doing? Uh, and so I thought that was very interesting. Um, that perhaps this image tells us that Jeb Bush literally didn't identify with his father as much as George did, right? And so he doesn't he doesn't inherit or or does not receive is this father's powers. Um, let me remove this from screen. And so I've seen this as well in tribal societies where the firstborn son uh, remains very tribalistic, whereas uh, younger siblings, they become more modern. They accept, they are more likely to accept the outside world. For example, uh, say modern Western explorers find a, a a primitive tribe they start interacting with this tribe the firstborn children will remain loyal to the traditions of their parents whereas the later born children they are the ones more open initially to receiving the the new uh, information from the outside world but strangely what is really a little bit bizarre is that in the western world because the, the birth rates in the western world are so low we have more firstborn children relatively speaking than we ever had before uh, I think over half of all the people living in the Western world today, no, half of people living in the Western world under age 20 or so is a firstborn or more because they don't have siblings anymore. So you only have, you have parents with one child and then they become, you know, the firstborn. Technically, that should mean that these children, we should have an extremely conservative, like almost fundamentalistically conservative society at this point because so many people in the Western world are now firstborns due to the low birth rates they should all be living up to their parents' expectations. But here you see another problem then. Uh, what if there's a mismatch? What if you have one child, it's a girl, and you have a very a father with an incredible desire to transfer his masculine energy somewhere, but he only has one child and it's a daughter. What happens is he transfers that to his daughter, pushes his daughter into the masculine energy, 
and the daughter tries to prove herself playing soccer or doing baseball or doing mountain biking, hike, whatever, right? Uh, masculine activities, so to speak, hunting activities. activities. And then you see their... Uh, uh, what I think may be the cause of this widespread transgenderism in the Western world uh, is that too many parents are are looking to transfer their their energy to their children, but they don't have the right children. They don't have. If you have many children, you can kind of uh, transfer parts of yourself to each of them. But if otherwise, the a single child would receive all of this pressure. And might not be able to cope with that or deal with that. So anyway, this is a little bit of a psychological story. Right? If you could do it all over again, you would homeschool your children. Yeah, of course. Because now you know, right? Now you know that the state system is not healthy for anybody, really. It's not healthy for children. The state system teaches you the scientific worldview all about uh, the disconnection from God and so on. I remember when I was in high school, at least we had uh, some religious education uh, because the parents still cared about that. And we were not allowed to be taught about the theory of evolution, for example, was not treated in our high school system because of the complaints from parents. So that was interesting that uh, maybe that's another reason why schools and states want to get parents away from their children, right? so that the parents don't even know what ch children are being taught in school. So that's how I would see it, yeah. All right, uh, I had another topic to discuss. It was the great mystery of why African-American children and African, like sub-Saharan African children are unable to recognize themselves in the mirror at young ages. Believe it or not, the average age, average age at which a white baby can recognize itself in the mirror is around uh, 12 months. 12 to 18 months, but it starts around 12 months. Um, for example, you draw a dot on a baby's forehead and the baby will look in the mirror and will try to grab the dot where it is. Right? Whereas an African-American 12-month-old 12 12 baby or like a sub-Saharan African baby, you draw a dot on their forehead and put them in front of the mirror and they will try to grab the dot in the mirror but not their own, meaning they, can't, they do not recognize themselves yet. Uh, they recognize themselves around five years of age. So I was thinking, I saw a documentary also about, uh, they put up these mirrors for a bear, for example. So a bear walks through the forest and sees a mirror. The bear sees itself in the mirror and then attacks the mirror. Uh, lions also are very confused about... Uh, uh, yeah, lions are very confused about what the mirrors. They try to look behind it if there's someone there. And but dolphins can recognize themselves in the mirror. Dolphins can. And so I thought like why is it that some kinds of animals can recognize themselves in the mirror and others can never recognize themselves in the mirror? And I have this theory now because they say they say that this has something to do with mirrors. Oh, black babies they didn't grow up with mirrors or they, they weren't socialized with mirrors as much as white people were. Uh, they make it about the mirrors, but of course dolphins don't grow up with mirrors. But when dolphins find a mirror, they are able to recognize themselves in the mirror because they, uh, they will use the mirror to flip their tail so they can look at parts of their bodies that they otherwise could never see, right? And so uh, that doesn't, that's not true because in Africa, you have puddles of water. You can see yourself in the water puddle. They have, right? They have reflective surfaces. They can see themselves there, right? They can recognize themselves. But still, the babies, the black babies, don't recognize themselves. So that's very interesting. Like, why is that? Why, why can't, why do black African babies recognize themselves in the mirror around age five, but white babies from white babies from twelve months? And I think the answer is a degree of. If you, have, if you make a spectrum of uh, mammalian life from highly social animals to like solitary predators, I get the impression that solitary predators like lions and bears and so on are less able to recognize themselves in mirrors, whereas highly social animals are able to recognize themselves in the mirror. Uh, there's going to be some loud music outside. I don't know. I'll, I'll just I'll have to break it off if it becomes too loud. But so my theory is that the reason why 
uh, social animals can recognize themselves in the mirror is that in order to be a social animal, it is a requirement that you recognize other members of your group as your equals. Whereas solitary predators um, do not recognize other members like them as their equals, but they, rec they don't recognize them that way because they're predatory, right? And so my, my theory is that African people are more predatory and less social than white people. So that's my theory why they, why they can't recognize themselves in the mirror, right? Uh, and it makes perfect sense to me why this, exp this would explain why African Americans, for example, are still more likely to commit rape and crime and murder per capita. And then of course they don't even understand per capita. This has become a meme now that they don't understand per capita. Uh, and I think that is because African-American males and females, both of them, African, like sub-Saharan African people, uh, have more trouble recognizing others uh, as their equals. So this also makes sense now. Why is it so that white people treat everybody as their equals? but we do not receive the same treatment from others, especially not from black people. There was a research that showed um, how much you people like themselves and how much they like others. White people rate all other races as about equal as themselves, whereas African-Americans only favor themselves and they basically look down on all the others, implying that it's actually the African-Americans who are most racist. Africans are the most racist people in the world. Right? But they project that onto others. And that, I think, is, is predatory psychology. If you are a predator uh, and you hate, uh, maybe you even hate yourself at that point, but then you project that onto others so that you, uh, you dehumanize them, basically. You don't see them as your equals anymore. You see them as prey to attack. And I think that's exactly what it is. You know? All right, all right. All right, this was just a little short. Uh, uh, I wanted to do a short little podcast for my podcast episode. So I'm going to upload this to my YouTube channel and to my uh, newsletter at jmk.info. So you can rewatch it there. Because uh, it's in the afternoon, I suppose there are not that many people watching now. So uh, then, uh, thanks for those of you who were here, though. And uh, I'll see you again uh, next week, you know.